In 2018, Colin O'Brady became the first person ever to cross the Antarctic continent alone, unsupported, and completely human powered. Now, he's trading his skis for oars. All right, boys. As part of an elite team attempting to become the first people in history to row from South America to Antarctica through 600 miles of the most treacherous and unpredictable waters on the planet, the Drake Passage. something we all have inside of us, which is these reservoirs of untapped potential to achieve extraordinary things. Set the world record for the Explorer's Grand Slam, which is to climb the tallest mountain on each of the seven continents, as well as complete expeditions to both the North Pole and the South Pole. So I climbed the tallest mountain on each of the 50 US states in just 21 days. Became the first person to cross Antarctica solo, unsupported, and unaided. There's a lot of people asking a big question, which is what is next? So the next thing I've got my sights set on is to try to become the first to ever cross the Drake Passage in a rowboat. Although I've never rowed a boat before in my life, I want to explore new avenues of my mind and body. And so that for me, the Drake Passage is an incredible opportunity to do this. The Drake Passage which is the waterway between the southern tip of South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. It is known in the world of seafaring as one of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous, waterway in the entire world as the Southern Ocean, the Atlantic, and the Pacific all converge. And you know, you're gonna confront most likely, you know, 30, 40 foot swells. You've got icebergs, you've got freezing cold temperatures, brutal storms, wind, weather, rain. And to take that on, you know, not just in a, you know, a sailing vessel, but in a rowboat where you're actually having to generate all of the power yourself, the emotional fortitude to keep rowing in those conditions are going to be very, very, very extreme. Your route obviously won't be perfectly straight with the waves and the currents and whatnot, um, but aiming right for the peninsula, so bypassing those outer islands. And so to do this expedition and to go down to Antarctica, you can't just take a vessel down there on your own. There's a lot of rules and regulations that Antarctica requires, and it requires an assisting vessel. So this will be the first big expedition that I will actually get to see and attend. Running the logistics from the ship will be quite interesting. It won't be like life on land where I've planned projects before. It'll be a dynamic environment to work from, from the water and from the ocean, and, and I'm excited for it. Wide open ocean, Drake Passage, and then landing on Antarctica. No big deal. Looks no, easy. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Casual. There it is. <laughs> what do you think? I love laying eyes on it after all the planning and preparation. It's amazing to see it. The rowboat itself is just over 25 feet in length. It's basically as spartan as you can possibly imagine. Smaller of the two hatches, the co-skippers will share this one. It's also where all the navigation and stuff is, so we'll be controlling more since we're in the leadership role. The other four will share this compartment back here. It's a little more spacious. I oh, mean, yeah. Huge, by, uh, hugely spacious. Yeah. <laughs> Two people in there. But now, the thing to imagine is there will always be people rowing 24-7. The boat itself needs to be in continuous motion because the Drake Passage is so intense that if you stop propelling yourself, you drift really quickly, constantly in this cycle of 90 minutes on, 90 minutes off. Three guys rowing, three guys resting, continuously crossing the Drake Passage. The safest part about this whole entire situation, right, is that the boat self rights This boat, hypothetically, in a massive storm, even if it were to flip over, it automatically flips back. And in massive storms, when it's getting maybe too hectic for us to even row at all, we need to have all six of us inside with the hatches battened down. And if we're all inside at the same time, there's basically enough room for us to just be shoulder to shoulder huddled up might last, you know, two or three days until the storm subsides enough for us to be able to continue to row. This new expedition is a completely different challenge. You know, there's not just one team member. It's not just Colin out there on the rowboat. 
you are hungry, you are dirty, you are injured, you are tired. You are wet, <laughs> it's dark, it's blowing, you know, it's noisy, it's scary, I mean, it's many things. And when you put it all together, it's a major fascination for me. Yeah. My mum thinks I'm completely insane, but I see it a different way. I think that these things can be overcome. I love pushing my physical limits. Because I was afraid of heights, I started climbing mountains. That gave way to a passion for discovering what else I could take on. I'm an elementary school principal and a dad, and I uh, was the captain of the Yale crew team. Not a lot of experience with ocean rowing. Just trying to do something that is, it felt to me like once in a lifetime. I just love the water. I do a lot of open water swimming in the ocean. I love rowing. It's an amazing experience. For me, it's to really push my own boundaries, to try to find the edges of human potential within myself. I've kind of identified myself as an athlete from a very young age. Won my first state championship in swimming when I was eight years old, and then ended up uh, getting the opportunity to swim at Yale University. Not long after graduating from college, ended up on this beach in rural Thailand, and there were some guys literally jumping a flaming jump rope. It looked like a fun activity, so I went ahead and jumped this flaming jump rope, and in an instant, my life changed. You know, the rope wrapped around my legs. 25% of my body was severely burned. If I didn't think the physical trauma was enough, the emotional trauma was even worse when a doctor walked in, he looked me straight in the eyes, and he said, you know, I hate to tell you this, Colin, but you'll probably never walk again normally. My immediate response was I was looking down at my legs, like life as I know it is over. But my mother, she kind of just kept at me with this love and this positivity, and ultimately one day encouraged me to kind of close my eyes and visualize uh, my future. And then in that moment, I visualized myself crossing the finish line of a triathlon, which is not something that I had personally ever done before. A year and a half after being told I would never walk again normally, I found myself at the start line of the Chicago Triathlon. You know, crossing that finish line that day, it was a complete and utter surprise. I hadn't actually just finished the race, but I won the entire Chicago Triathlon. That burn accident and ultimately that recovery and what I learned about myself, and that's where the seeds were sown to kind of continue to push the edges of my own potential. Colin really strives to inspire others. So when he goes out there doing these things, he is looking to push his own personal limit, but it's really in an effort to showcase that we are all capable of this, that what we strive to accomplish and what we dream to do and be is totally within our own capacity. That's what makes him tick pushing his limits and finding his potential and sharing that with others. The next expedition, it's gonna take a wild arrangement to actually make it all happen and come together. We plan as best as we can. Of course, we know that we'll be encountering setbacks and obstacles along the way. There's a fine line between excitement and fears, but I'm really looking forward to it. It's hard to say what exactly I'm going to be facing on the Drake Passage, but it's safe to say that it's going to be one of the most treacherous experiences of my entire life. Follow the expedition in real time on Discovery.